All right. Uh, I want to I want to start by acknowledging that this presentation is being done by the Canadian uh, the Kelowna Canadian Italian Club. Um, the Kelowna Canadian Italian Club is situated on the traditional and unceded territories of the Okanagan Silic Nation. This has been their land since time immemorial. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce Gabriella Colusi Arthur. Uh, Gabriella is from York University where she's been teaching Italian language, Italian culture. We were just chatting before we started and actually what we're talking about tonight, she said was her passion. It's what took her down the academic road. So Gabriella, maybe share a little bit of that journey with us. Okay, well, thank you to everyone. And I said to Gord when I joined a little bit earlier that this was a great gift he gave me because uh, I have been a bit disconnected from teaching um, in the last couple of years. And then I had already decided a number of years ago to take early retirement, but that doesn't mean that I'm disconnected from the academic world. And um, as Gordon knows and other, others, I am involved in the Italian Canadian um, Archives Project, ICAP, and um, so the, that the umbrella of my experience in Italian studies had, has been quite varied. When I began, I was doing second language teaching primarily. I was very lucky in high school uh, to have been part of that time in which languages were king and queen. It was very prestigious to be studying language. We had uh, extensive courses beginning from grade nine in Ontario. We had five years of high school. So, you know, I started French in grade nine through to grade 13. And then I started Italian in grade 10 through to grade 13. By the time I was in grade 13, I was doing work that today we struggled to introduce at the master's level. So I had a great head start. I had extraordinary um, teachers, professors, uh, some of whom are like embedded in my DNA and I'm working with, I'm talking, I'm using their work tonight in this presentation. So my background is I, so I was born in, in Toronto, but my parents are from Friuli and they immigrated in the fifties. And I was part of the cohort of people who were young immigrants and had come uh, when they were children. And so I had many, many people in my class who had come to Toronto when they were uh, five, six, in the case of some people, 11 years of age, and then were integrated the whole story of being a young immigrant person, integrated into a school system that was so different from if you had already begun school in Italy, it was so different from Italy. You had language challenges. They would put people back and then accelerate. I mean, it was a quite complicated time. This to say that I was very, very close to um, the immigrant world. I was part of it. And my friends were the friends from the diasporic world. And in Toronto, that meant the Friulani, the Veneti, the Calabresi, the Abruzzesi, um, the Siciliani, these were all my neighbors and we all met in class and in school. So uh, I uh, had a number of interests and through, you know, experiences, I found that language was my, my strongest interest and pursued that. But I was so fascinated by the history of dialects. And when I um, started at the University of Toronto, my professor was the renowned Gian Renzo Clivio, who was the expert in historical linguistics. And next to him was the junior Marcel Danesi, who was the expert in synchronic linguistics. So what we experienced at U of T in those years was really extraordinary. This cohort and uh, of, of strong young Italian professors uh, schooled in all of this uh, history. And you know we had easy access to this. So this is how I began. And um, so the gift that, that uh, Gord gave me was really to invite me to um, get back into preparing a pedagogical presentation and also to talk on you know, one of the most interesting topics I think there is. 
I'm gonna to try to be as brief as I can because literally this is a topic that fills libraries and that constitutes the career of entire armies of people. So um, it's complicated. I've tried to break it down very simply. I've tried to make it pedagogical, show you some interesting texts, and then at the end, um, bring you in uh, with a little bit of kind of audience participation. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen and start from the top. I'm good. Uh, Hi. Okay. Is, can are. everyone see that? Yep. Well, okay, super duper. So uh, the topic, as you know, is the dialetti, the evolution of Italian dialects. Now let's see what's going on here. Uh, you still can hear me, correct? Okay. So I've tried to prepare this presentation in three parts. The first is to give you the Italian story, the history of transition from classical Latin to vulgar Latin, and outline uh, the story of Italian um, dialects and some typical characteristics. This is quite, quite complicated. Therefore, I'm being very, very brief. Part two is the Canadian migration story. What I want to bring to your attention is what happens when Italians migrate from their homeland to Canada and what kind of puzzle uh, develops in front of us and how the various waves of immigration are involved and change that uh, across Canada. And then the third is kind of to reach out to you and talk to you about what experience you might have had in this uh, panoramic puzzle and to investigate some of the words that actually might have entered into your family and that still form for a part of your family culture. I'm going to now run through a series of key terms because this is after all linguistics and I can't avoid using them. So you may want to take notes um, just uh, so that, you know, when I come to them later, you know, you're not, you, you feel a little more comfortable. So uh, also I wanted to say that I'm trying to use also make reference to the Italian words because uh, after all, I studied all of this in Italian language. I'm not accustomed to discussing this topic in English. So uh, it, it's out there now. Uh, you know, Italy has reached out to the Italian language now for a number of decades, but in my time, the only way I could study this was in Italian standard. So classical Latin uh, sometimes can also be called high Latin, not typical. It's a term that is typically used in German. Uh, what we call it in Italian, il Latino classico. Vulgar Latin has nothing to do with vulgarity. It means a Latin koine, koine from the Greek word that means the common language. So it translated into Italian as il volgare, also uh, now used, uh, referred to as il Latino comune o il Latino popolare. So in order to ensure that there's no um, misunderstanding with what that actually means. Then we move on to the Romance languages, which are nothing else but the Neo-Latin languages. And because that was the classical world of ancient Rome, and so that's how the Roman was in, kept in, into that term. But in fact, we call them in linguistics, the Neo-Latin, when we're talking, you know, um, kind of uh, doing class classifications, but pop in the popular language, we talk about the Romance languages, le lingue romanze. Then languages never really leave. As you may have noticed in your own experience, when something enters, it stays. So we refer to this in linguistics as the substrata, the evidence that the languages before us have remained. And this is a very big uh, tradition uh, in the genealogical tradition of, of Italy. Il sottostrato. And then we've got 
uh, dialects, the term that we used to use, and I'll talk about this in a moment, uh, we now prefer to say regional languages and their varieties. Then diglossia, which means two, using two languages at the same time, having two uses. And then an isogloss, which is basically a line of demarcation, which I'll be showing you, and I wanted to give you the appropriate term, isogloss. Parts two and three have to do with what happens in language contact when you have uh, immigration, uh, immigration, migration generally, nativization, which is a term that many of you may have already heard through history, and then ethnoluck, which is the technical term for what became the identification of Italiese in our community. So classical Latin is nothing but, uh, you, many of you will know uh, or may remember from early schooling, the elegant and cultured form of Latin used in all forms of writing throughout ancient Rome and considered the official language of knowledge uh, transfer in antiquity. And I would say not just in antiquity, but for a long time forward because in my time, um, it was very important for me to study Latin and that was in the seventies. So it was still quite important. Clearly through the history of antiquity, Latin is the language of writing. Then vulgar Latin, Latin koine, uh, is used among the common people and throughout ancient Rome. Uh, the aristocrats in Rome, in the Roman um, um, uh, politics, they conducted their affairs in classical Latin, but they spoke a popular Latin uh, with their slaves and among their friends. It begins to appear in written form in the fourth and fifth century um, after Christ, um, Anno Domini or Common Era. Roman languages, excuse me, Romance languages, uh, the family of official, standard, national, modern languages. Because each of these has a set of its own family of sub-languages varieties. So again, I refer to official, standard, national, modern languages. Italian, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Catalan, Romanian. In addition, to Latin, there remain traces of substrata, idioms, ancient Greek from the Magna Grecia period in Southern Italy, the Oscar Umbro, uh, Umbrian from the Italico Umbrian peoples in ancient Umbria, Etruscan from the Sabine peoples in Etruria, no longer of course exists, the ancient Etruria between the Tiber and Arno, Arno rivers, west and south of the Apennines and Phoenician in Sardinia which is why Sardo is so completely different from all of the other uh, regional languages in Italy. Now, dialects uh, deriving from standard or national languages, these comprise varieties used locally in regions, cities, and towns, each with their own set of written and spoken features. And I'd like to interject at this moment, uh, what Clevio, Professor Clevio said when we first got into class, and we be, he asked us, you know, what relationship do you have to dialect? And the relationship was that we felt nervous about those of us in class learning standard Italian. We were nervous about knowing and being able to speak dialects. And he said very forcefully because he was a very proud Piedmontese. Uh, he said, there is nothing the only difference between a dialect and a national language is that a dialect lacks an army and a navy. In terms of its importance in language and culture and identity, it is as important as the standard language. And in fact, he was the number one promoter of two languages in every uh, household, if not more. Because in fact, in Clevio's family, he actually taught his eldest son Latin. So he was a multilingual, a promoter of you know, multilingualism, but in, it, in Italy, he believed that all families should have the ability to communicate in their family language, their 
town language, their local language, but also then be able to use this ticket to move around Italy, which would be the national language. So the glossia is what I just referred to, a situation where both languages coexist and are in use. And the line that I wanted to bring to your attention that demarcates the uh, greatest differences between dialects is what's called in Italy, uh, so under Liguria. Uh, so just basically when you're looking at the map, so we're, imagine that you're looking at the map of Italy. So under Liguria, the point literally where it turns into Le Cinque Terre. So from La Spezia, Rimini to the Adriatic. And it kind of drops like this a bit. That is the most significant line of demarcation uh, in uh, understanding the enormous differences between the dialects. Uh, language content and native, nativization, contact and nativization is what happens to diaspora communities when they enter uh, a new land. They undergo processes of language change as a result of language contact. Nativization is the process of adapting to local standard language. And in our case, Canadian English ensues. Um, the prototypical case of Italian, Italian dialect adaptation by diasporic Italian immigrant speakers, predominantly among the large community of Italian immigrants in Southern Ontario, was first identifies, identified in, in the 1970s and 1980s uh, by a group of the profs um, at the University of Toronto. Uh, the diaspora is basically the term we use uh, when we identify an area or the persons therein who live outside their provenance of origin, uh, the place where their ancestors lived. And the ethnolect is basically a, a diminutive of ethnic dialect, a version of language origin, which comes from borrowing and um, adaptation. And as I said, this was in the 70s and 80s identified in Canada and given the term Italiese, the Americans do not, the Italian, um, the Italian Americans do not use this term, they use other terms. Um, but uh, the, the reason we stand out is because we gave this ethnolec uh, its own label, its own identity. So how do we get from classical Latin to the dialects? Well, I'm giving you a brief overview. So um, I'll do my best to be quick. Uh, there are various stages. Uh, I've given you uh, a reduced set of those stages. Uh, in antiquity, we have principal literary and professional authors, historian Catone, the playwright Plauto, the novelist Petronio, and the agricultural writer Columella. Of these, I signal um, the novelist Petronio because his satiricon uh, highlights a particular character who is a complete breakthrough in Latin literature, old Latin literature. Uh, Petronio wants to describe a real person. So he uses expressions of time that are popular in pl plebeian. And this character expresses himself according to his surroundings and his appearance. So this was a, 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 an enormous break. And so this is you know, a big check on the calendar. Oh my, uh, Petronio is moving away from the model and trying to connect telling his audience, we have changes, this is our society. The second are the principal ecclesiastics, and, and this is a tradition right through when we get Christianity that enters uh, ancient Rome uh, in order to promote Christianity, they have to speak to the illiterate. And you will know from having traveled in Italy 
and in the main churches, uh, a visual art is propaganda, all the main moments in the Bible, but there also begins to be sermons and poetry um, written to reach out to the common person. Um, Saint Jerome is um, identified as having tra uh, translated the Bible from Greek in 382 AD. It's officially called the Vulgate. And Saint Augustine, who is known uh, one of the major persons, philosophers also, he is known to have written something called um, the Exposition of the Psalms, where he's actually trying to speak to people as in their own uh, expressions. And he's criticized for this. So he responds to this criticism by writing in Latin, it's better for grammarians to blame us than for people not to understand. So he, this is the first attempt to communicate simply. Then as has happened in all formal education, even in you know, classical Latin, you had people who were educating people. So you have Latin grammarians who were exposing common errors. And then you had um, people who would be officially recording the language. These were lexicographers and glossarians. And what they would do is they would try to keep tabs on changes that were occurring so that this would be an official document. You could either, either use it in your work or it would then be an official document to be kept in the archives. The most significant list is um, compiled by Valerio Probo and it is titled the Appendix Probi. It contains uh, 227 words that illustrate changes that had already occurred. And these changes foreshadow the transition into Romance languages. So I just wanted to give you a sense. There are many, many, uh, 227. I'll give you what was listed as uh, an incorrect usage. So uh, on the right, I show you the incorrect uh, from the correct auricula, which was already a diminutive of auricula. Um, people were shortening that to auris. And this was identified as, oh, they're actually identifying this part of the body as auris. Well, in fact, the diminutive auricula, uh, from auricula, the diminutive auricula is what enters uh, as the metamorphosis into the Romance language. In Italian, we get orecchia. In France, in French, we get oreille. In Spanish, orea, oreja in Portuguese and ureje in Romanian. So fourth evidence, uh, category of evidence, uh, common usage, where do we find this? We find this in private settings, such as funeral stones in small countryside cemeteries, mur mural graffiti with popular sayings. And incredibly, there was a particular study uh, uh, discovered, uh, made of the Pompeii ruins. And they came upon this particular body of artifacts. They found inscriptions on stones. So what would they be saying in popular Latin? They would be writing about the food rations given to slaves, the winnings in the game of dice, uh, the date of the birth of somebody's mule, and then all manner of expressions uh, love, affection, hate, resentment, jealousy, joy, sadness. Well, you know, a version of our social media. So it turns out that the Pompeians were known as being very vulgar and trivial. And they created hundreds of these inscriptions and they were actually unearthed in the ruins of Pompeii. One of these is the, the commentary by whomever it would have been to say, oh my God, how can we have so many of these? And it's actually a piece of the wall where they say, admiror pareas te non setides ruinis qui tot scriptorum te sustineas. He's talking to the wall and saying, oh my goodness, dear wall, 
How is it you have not died from the weight of those who've written so many um, terrible inscriptions? So this is quite amusing um, to have discovered that. So from the amusement, we get into more official evidence of vulgar Latin entering in written form. So the first full writing in vulgar Latin is titled Lindovinello Veronese. It's the Veronese riddle. And there it is in, uh, in Latin. It is a metaphor uh, on the act of writing. So he drove the oxen, plowed a white field, held a white plow and sowed black seed. The oxen represents the fingers of the page. The white field is the page. The white plow is the quill and the black seed is the ink. And so it begins to emerge that people are taking the spoken word into writing and this is actually evidence of Veronese. So it is actually written in the Veronese style. From there, we get the second breakthrough, again, official writing. These are juridical documents. Uh, they were preserved, discovered, <clears throat> and preserved in a Monte Cassino library uh, monastery. And they are four uh, brief and very similar sentences that I'm about to you, detailing a dispute on several lands between three Benedictine monasteries and a local landowner. Described according to the established legal formulae of the day by witnesses during the legal trials, these texts are exceptional because they are couched in vulgar Latin rather than in classical Latin. So here they are quite, quite impressive. So we're going from 960 uh, to 963. And for those of you who have a uh, facility with dialects, you will already see emergence of something that you hear, that you can still hear. So Sauco che le terre, perché le terre fini, che che chi contene trent'anni le possette parte santi benedicti. So what we have is the lexicon that is changing, the pronunciation that is changing. What stays the same here is the Latin, uh, the order of the Latin sentence. In other words, the syntax. That still persists at this time. So they've got, there you've got the four of them, um, um, each, each uh, pronounced by witnesses. So it was against St. Benedict, against Perogaldo, against St. Mary, um, and they were trying to uh, get through this dispute. So this takes us to the end of the first century. From the first century onwards, then uh, the ball begins rolling more intensively. And we have the, involve, the evolving separate Northern languages. So again, uh, these are two of the best known authors of the moment. Uh, they cross over their, you know, novelists, poets, uh, ecclesiastics, clerics. Um, clearly they were people, very few people who had been educated and they have this uh, responsibility of writing and they write in try to, in, to speak to the spoken, uh, in, to the people of the time. So on the um, left of your screen, I give you a visual, which is a depiction uh, from uh, the work of Bonvezin de la Riva, who was Milanese, wrote in Lombard, in Lombardo. And he's very well known for having written the marvels of I Milanesi. And in this treatise, he dedicates a chapter to what the Milanese used to eat and drink. So it's actually considered um, um, an histor a history of, Mil of uh, Milanese cuisine. And on the right, I have Giacomino da Verona. Of course, you can see where he's from because it says where he's from, like Leonardo da Vinci. This is Giacomino da Verona. He was a minor um, uh, uh, brother from the order of Ifrati Minori. 
And he wrote didactic religious poems in Veronese. And he actually wanted to be very dramatic. He wanted to uh, be able to explain uh, why it was very important to adopt Christianity because Christianity would save you. And if you weren't saved, there were visions of you descending into hell. So he has two very uh, striking um, uh, poems, short poems that are didactic called the vision, the visionary uh, poems. So uh, a quick overview. The Placiti are believed to represent an ancestor of the Neapolitan dialect rather than standard Italian based on Florentine. Uh, following the year 1000, the texts become more common and there continues to be considerable linguistic diversity. By the 13th century, so this is the 1200s, you get Bonvezin, um, bon who I showed you, and Giacomino, who I showed you, and they write, uh, and their, uh, their role is basically pedagogical and didactic. What I am not including in this presentation and cannot be included here at all is Dante Alighieri, even though, as many of you will know, and from the celebration last year, 20, uh, 2021, um, uh, we celebrating the, the, the death of Alighieri in 1321, he is the father of Italian standard. And I can tell you that, um, that, uh, that role, um, having the, the time around Dante and what happens at the time of Dante and the persons who were with Dante and who followed Dante, that's a topic of another presentation, which I would be happy to give you another time. But why I say this here is that from this moment on, we get something in Italy called la questione della lingua. And this persists until the 19th century. And immigrants travel with this still kind of on their backs. How to resolve a national standard language in Italy. So let's get back to the dialects. So what's evolving? Well, what's evolving are the Neo-Latin varieties and they're evolving into uh, considerable languages that can be identified and that are being used in writing. So we have Balkan Romance, Romanian, Italic Romance, Dalmatian, Dalmatic, which is completely has disappeared, Italian, Sardinian, Ladino and Reto Romanche, uh, which is uh, a, a version uh, of the language currently still spoken in Switzerland. Uh, then we've got the Gallo Romance, French, Franco Provencal, Provencal and Gascon, and Catalan. And then we have the Iberian Roma Romance, Spanish and Portuguese. So how, what is happening when this evolution is taking place? Well, I wanted to give you a sense of something simple that you could easily see. Um, and this, one of the simple features is how the words evolve from Latin and where they fall on the map of the Romance language. So in Latin, we have three words for the word horse. We've got equa. We have jumenta and we have caballa. And these slowly change and you see where they drop. Uh, in France, in Portugal, in uh, Spain, and in Italy. And uh, there to the right is Romania. With uncle, Quite interesting. Um, avunculus, tius, and barbas. And um, I was saying to Gord, I'm actually in my husband's study. And um, my husband is actually a professor of philosophy, but he's a fantastic philologist. And we have looked high and low for the evidence of the term tius. 
we have not found it in Latin. So already it's a metamorphosis of something that we will eventually locate. But these three terms drop into the Romance language map. And you'll see, I wanted to bring to your attention, that in the north, the north part of Italy, we've got Barba. So we've got the Piemontese saying me Barba, the Milanese saying me Barba, the Venetian saying me Barba, and the Friulani saying me Barba. And then the rest are doing a version of zeal. Whereas in Spain, they, it changes the pronunciation becomes teal. Very interesting, I wanted to bring this to your attention. How does the term blind, uh, literally, I mean, so many words from Latin and they actually distribute them themselves quite, quite interestingly. And in Romania, they even, you know, they have a split even in Romania. So um, some of you may uh, recognize Orbo in Friulian. You'll see that it's in the part of also um, um, down the, the Dalmatian side in Croatia uh, there. Um, Vuarp, which we also use in, in, uh, in Friulano. And then you've got versions of Ceco, Cecalu, and Orbu. Uh, so many terms from Latin, and, you know, much uh, transition, transition into the Romance languages. Then uh, I wanted to show you a verb. W why, for example, you know, where do these terms, you know, comer and papar end up? And, you know, manger in French. Well, there are actually four terms from Latin and they, uh, they break up across the map, as you see here illustrated. Uh, another very interesting one uh, is the term for head. Um, so uh, turns out that there is, you know, testa in Latin. Those of you who know French will know that the circumflex in French is basically like the vacuum cleaner. It sucks up the S. So whenever you see the circumflex, that's what it has done from Latin. So testa becomes tet. But in Spain, they say cabeza. Uh, in Italian, we say testa. As we go down, we've got coche, capo, testa, conca. And in some cases, they say capocha. They, they marry the two. So here we have a closer look of how it's broken down in Italy. So testa capo, testa kind of breaks up depending upon where you are in the north. Um, I'm not obviously, this, this illustration does not give you the dialect pronunciation, just gives you how it breaks down in what we might call standard Italian. So it's already, Ready, comp it's quite complicated even in the standard, among the standard. You can imagine then when you add the phonetic differences, how complicated it becomes. So let me give you a look at um, what the dialects looked like uh, from a map in 1937. Um, the, the business of lexicography and linguistics is uh, very, very deeply rooted in the Italian tradition. Um, and so we have this really, you know, we've got many, many um, uh, famous professors of this topic. So I'm giving you uh, a, a, a view of the map created by Merlo, Carlo Merlo in 1937. And this is reproduced in Carlo Talavini's book in 1969, who is one of my personal heroes and who formed the basis of this presentation tonight in terms of the history of, of dialects. So you can see uh, how we share the geography with the immediate neighbors. I wanted you to have a look at that. So you can see up in the North, the presence of the Germanic language and how there is pressure, but with that pressure southward, we still have an isogloss, a line of demarcation from Ladino and Retoromanche. 
and then it comes down, you see, um, they, they change. But in the, in the index there, you'll see we've got Toscano, Tuscan, you've got uh, central, um, southern um, dialects, northern dialects, settentrionali, you've got Galluresi from Corsica. Remember, you will remember that Corsica used to belong to Italy and then was ceded to France, but linguistically it shares this history with us. Then Sardinian and Provençal, Ladin, Romanian, the German I spoke of, uh, Slavic languages, there is a tradition of Slavic. And what I wanted to bring your attention to was the little blobs of black, which identify the Italo-Albanian communities that migrated from the Magna Grecia. So these are traditions that started in antiquity and still, I mean, to date, there are Italo-Albanian communities, principally in Basilicata and in um, Apulia and in Calabria. So I use this again to give you the um, La Spezia Rimini divide. And you'll see from using this uh, legend that when he says, um, Merlo that is, he says confini di etali maggiori, you can see kind of a heavier dotted line um, that goes across the central uh, north. Or where the, what I, what I used to say to the students when I was teaching Italian, just imagine, you know, it's like wearing a set of, uh, of hose. And when you got the part of the elastic up there near the top of the leg, that's where we are. That's where we are across just nearly the top of the leg. So it divides into three main uh, uh, areas, the Northern Italian dialects, the Central Southern dialects, and the Tuscan and Corsican dialects. Now, I wanted to offer you a, a kind of a brighter sense of today, oh my goodness, what dialects are present, still are present in Italy. And there's a reason why they're back again, as it were. I'll address this a little bit later while they're back again. Um, uh, but it is rich and the immigrants who, who left traveled with this richness with them, built into their DNA, into their linguistic profiles. So, what have we got? Uh, they start to break down into terms that you may be familiar with or now begin to recognize. So we've got, you know, Piedmontese, Piemontese, Lombardo, Ligure, and then in Emilia Romagna, they have their own versions, L'Emiliano Romagnolo. In Veneto, we have Venetian, but again, a number of uh, sub varieties. Then we've got Estriano, uh, which has, you know, died out mostly, but, you know, there is some evidence in some communities. Uh, my colleague in ICAP, uh, Conrad Eisenbichler, is a specialist of this, of the community. Then we have the language that did completely uh, disappear, which was Dalmatian, Dalmatic, Sardinian, and Ladino. Then we've got Marchigiano from the Marches, Le Marche, Lumbria, Umbro, Romanesco, in uh, kind of Rome, in, it has its own variety. Then we have Abruzzese, Pugliese, Molisano, Napoletano, Lucano, which is the ancient term for Basilicata. And many immigrants, uh, you know, if they have their, so the nonni who would have immigrated uh, would remember La Basilicata called La Lucania. Their children, because they have immigration documents, you know, in your passport, it would not say that it would say La Basilicata. So they would be more familiar with this. And their children, maybe you and maybe your children, would obviously recognize La Basilicata. But uh, we, we must bring this to everyone's attention in, an, in order to identify what immigrants communities would be using. And then we've got Salentino. In the Tuscan, subset, we have obviously Florentine, which is not what Dante wrote in. He wrote in a version of Tuscan. Fiorentino is what they speak in Florence with the hoja hola, 
uh, and uh, many of you who've been there and hearing them with that guttural aspiration. Then there are versions of it in Pisa, Pisan, in Lucca, in Pistoia, the Western variety. Then in Siena, which has its own, which is quite, quite strong and, and marked. And then Arezzo and Terni also have their own versions of this. <clears throat> so I hope, I hope this has been not too complicated. And this kind of gives you a sense of the enormous richness um, that existed in Italy for so long, was at risk of being lost and was reinvigorated for two reasons. And I think, uh, shall I tell you now or shall I tell you later? Let me see here, hold on, let me check my notes. <laughs> well, let me tell you, let me tell you now. So, um, uh, before we get into immigration. So the great moment in Italy, as you all will know, is the unification of Italy. So 1861, 1860, 1861 takes them another while to get Rome um, integrated, 1870. When they have the first um, kingdom, uh, the, um, the court under the, the um, uh, Vittorio Emanuele II, Vittorio Emanuele II, speaks Piemontese, um, he doesn't speak standard Italian because there is none, because schooled people were diglossic and they gave pre uh, predominance to the language that had emerged also in writing, poetry, novels. So we had Piemontese, we had Milanese, we had Venetian, we had Veronese, we had Siciliano. So there was the Sicilian school. So um, when Italy is founded as a nation, they're founded, abbiamo fatto l'Italia, says Mazzini, ma non abbiamo fatto gli italiani. You know, we've created Italy, but we haven't created someone called the Italians, a body called the Italians. Um, so we have the language question, that's where we begin with la questione della lingua. Then there is something that we, through COVID, has, have had to experience. In 1871, they had pestilence. They had malaria. There was enormous mortality. P kid, children wouldn't even live, many children didn't live to the age of five. So you had your, your society was under great uh, stress. Then the model was very, uh, the, the, the predominant model was illiteracy. Very few people schooled. There was no national schooling. So 61, almost 62% of, of men and almost 76% of women were illiterate. So it is not surprising that la questione della lingua becomes, you know, is put on the table and they have to make a big effort to create the Ministry of Education and begin a policy to invoke um, uh, mandatory schooling, which from the early years of unification was grade three. And then by the Second World War, again, as many immigrants experienced, was grade five. So mandatory schooling in the end of the 1800s, early 1900s, up until grade three. And then uh, further ahead during uh, previous to the Second World War up until grade five. Why do I bring this to your attention? Again, I want to get into the Canadian migration story in a minute. To tell you that uh, migrants traveled with the term dialect. And the term dialect in the diaspora, I would say even within Italy itself, uh, was not welcome. You are expected to know standard Italian and to interact in, with standard Italian. Now, in the diaspora, 
This is particularly necessary because you can imagine like Vittorio Emanuele II, when he gets around his round table, the same thing happens to the immigrants when they get here. They go onto the job site, one speaking Friulano, the other one speaking Calabrian, the third one speaking Marchigiano, the other one speaking Trevigiano. They had to find a common language. Not everyone had the standard, even in the diaspora community, which will bring us to uh, where we're going. Now, final point before I get here. What changed in Italy? Well, many things changed, but the greatest change to the linguistic policy in Italy happened in the year 2000. As you know, finally, Italy within the European Union, there was an official policy called the Minority Language Preservation Policy. And that was passed on June 27th in the year 2000. That has consolidated and reinvigorated the presence of dialects and many young people, uh, are even you, know, you may know them yourselves, in ethnomusicology, all new languages being um, sung in, uh, presented on the main stage. Um, this has been the reinvigoration and it's happened all throughout Italy, all the way down into the little towns and, um, and cities uh, of the regions. Okay, let's move to part two. So what do we, there's a lot that can be said about Italians in Canada. I want to bring to your attention the preeminent uh, piece of literature, which was written by Bruno Ramirez in 1989, the history, uh, um, the um, professor of history from um, um, Montreal. And this document was updated, but Abril will, is better, I've lost the actual date. It was uh, updated by the Elia chair. Um, and I've just forgotten the, the official date in the early 2000s. He actually updated this document. I'm using the original one uh, for the, prop, uh, the purposes of this presentation. So what do we know about Italians coming to Canada? This is what we know. We have numbers and the dots show you where they, how they distribute across Canada. This tells us uh, ac across uh, a timeline, uh, the numbers. And they, for you in the West, they are very significant. At the turn of the century, uh, from 1901 to 1910, quite significant. Another round, strong arrivals, um, 1911 to 1920. Then of course, the war happens, um, Mussolini changes the laws, um, there's a complete stop for a while or only limited what we call family re reunification. And then of course, after the Second World War, the, the taps turn on again and the numbers are significant, uh, except that the difference between the first wave, as we call it, it's the first wave to the, to the west, the second wave to the east. Um, this gives us a sense again of the distribution. Uh, I don't wanna stay too long on this, but it, you know, we do have good, good census records to show across the decades and where, uh, distributed across Canada. So I'm going to keep that in the back of our minds when I discuss more now for a moment, demographics and origins. So up until uh, 1891, uh, arriving predominantly through Montreal. So we're talking about Ellis Island, Ellis Island connecting by train to Montreal. And there is also evidence of some uh, ship arrivals directly to Montreal through the St. Lawrence, not as significant, obviously, as arriving through Ellis Island. So leaving, what do we know about the exodus? We have 67% from the north, 11% from central Italy, and 22% from the south. 
but slowly but surely the the given the repercussions of unification through the center and the south and the loss of um the 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 the, the breaking of the promises uh through unification um and we have a number of excellent films that document this uh, slowly the south begins to join the migration movement and in italy uh, excuse me in canada they uh, join they they are able to enter canada through the labor agent recruitment system which persists in canada and becomes a problem um, the what's called the padrone system um, it had been a problem already with migration in the states and had been outlawed but it continued to be commonplace so which areas were um, main areas of exodus friuli veneto marche lazio um, basilicata campania calabria sicilia and uh, i don't know how i dropped this by mistake Abruzzo, Molise. So this is uh, coming back to that, just so you could see it once again. So here, uh, I'm now entering into a, a closer breakdown of what it means to be coming from Friuli to what it means to be coming from Veneto to be coming from um, Le Marche. Um, so we begin to identify cities and areas. And I have to say people identify themselves. As you know, people would never say, I'm from Italy. People would not even say, I'm from Friuli. On their document paper, they would say, I'm from Udine. And they would say, I'm from Cosenza. I'm from Catanzaro. I'm from La Mezza Terme. They would never identify at the macro level, always at the micro level. So um, I wanted to give you, to remind you, um, uh, give you a list of the 20 regions of Italy. And I've done them in kind of red, white, and green there to break them up, a north, central, south to ask ourselves okay so where are they coming from and where are they going again so that you're familiar with the the names of the regions and the discussion the presentation that continues so if you came from the north you would arrive you would perhaps already be schooled you would have had um so in the first wave where we would have assumed they would have had three years of education if they were coming from uh, the end uh, of the 1800s and the early 1900s. So one of my studies, the study that I did of the Friulani immigrants to British Columbia from 1901 to 1926, those people had had, those migrants had had three years of schooling my grandfather, who emigrated to Argentina, uh, sorry, um, uh, pardon me, his parents who emigrated would have had uh, three years of school. Um, this is what would have taken place. We know that there would have been challenges in particular families, but we can by and large assume that there is a level of standard Italian in their baggage. So you are coming diglossic to Canada. You're Friulano, but you can speak Italian. You're Veneto. The Venetians are very Venetian. It's very similar to Italian. They might not. Um, the Piemontese, absolutely. The Lombards, absolutely. <clears throat> If you're from the center, uh, you would have had the kind of more central Tuscan uh, that would make you understood. The primary feature of this variety is all phonological. You sound very different. 
but the words are similar to standard Italian, obviously, because Tuscan, you know, became through Dante, the standard. And in the South, you would identify what you speak by these terms. Uh, parlo Abruzzese, I speak Abruzzese, parlo Molisano, parlo Barese. Uh, some people might say Pugliese, not very many. Um, parlo Lucano, Calabrese, Siciliano, and we have very few Sardinians um, in, in Toronto. Um, very uncommon to, to, to hear uh, Sardo in, in the immigrant communities in Canada. So if you allow me, if you're not tired, um, I'd like to give you, and hope that this works, I'd like to give you uh, snippets of the language so you can hear it. So let's see if it works. So in 2012, the Ente Friuli nel Mondo uh, brought together this uh, small team of lovely young Friulani who created these snippets of Friulano so that it could be disseminated across the globe as a pedagogical tool. Impariamo come presentarci. La frase piacere di conoscerti. In Friulano si dice la sé di cognositi. La sé di cognositi. La sé di cognositi. La frase mi chiamo Martina. In Friulano si dice o hai non Martina. Now uh, not exactly true because in Friuli there are four varieties and I do not speak Friulano that way. So uh, one of the most important, um, uh, you know, important contributions I've tried to make to the Friulian community is the recognition in the diaspora community of four varieties and the use thereof in the communities across Canada. Uh, so we have to make the distinction between Friuli, the Friulian language as decided in Friuli, what they have decided to teach as a regional language in school and, and the books that they've created. Uh, but in the diasporic community, uh, the way my father spoke and the work that I did documenting his experiences is in a variety called Casarsese, it's from the Pordenone side. So in, uh, in the diaspora, we have to be very mindful uh, that communities have their own manner of expression. And when we study their manner of expression, we have to be true to their uh, natural language. Going from a Northern dialect, we wanna move to uh, let's see, uh, let's see if I've got it here. Okay. Ay, che bobbena d'umoretta, la sorella fa trua, nasce i bulletta. Now, I could, uh, we could keep, this is every, every one of these is a course unto itself. Um, so I, I just want you to kind of, have an opportunity to hear. It might bring something back in your memory. 
you may still have a body of knowledge in your community this way. Vocabulary. Rouge, orange, gialli. Verde, blu, viola. Nir, bianc, grigio. Luliet, lo guardarobe, la casa. Lo telef, la televisión, la seggia. La tavola, lo capiel, la maglia. Lo cabezón, la scarpa. Camboash, termole, agnon, murabiel, miniatu, larin, sandagroj, sernia, razan, uru, cabragot. Sample text. Qua nishune shen, tu shinu pork, lu buon giorno, se vede dalla mattina, nesputa bellaria, caderrem bach. So, Again, this may bring something back to you uh, and it, you may have samples of this. I have to say that I know uh, very little of the Malaysian dialect because my expertise is in Friulano, but our board member in ICAP, Roberta Yanachito uh, Provenzano, has written uh, her, wrote her thesis on the dialect of San Michele, which apparently is out of the world, out of this world. And it is breaks even the traditions with typical Molizano. So I, I invite uh, Roberta to, to present that another time. And we, you know, um, we can't um, ignore the Sicilians because as you may know from your Sicilian brothers, they never identify themselves as Italians. They've always only called themselves Sicilians. And uh, we used to have this uh, joke in class. She said, ma io non sono italiano, sono siciliano. So let's have a listen to that as well. Cucarrozzone, a mucha dieta 41, assumola, assumola. Assumola, la trottola. La trottola, però si legava. Se io mariava con un pezzo di spago, a sta, sta trottola, e poi si lanciava. So, uh, again, we could spend the whole evening just on this as an analysis, but I wanted to give you a little bit of, of uh, that, uh, a, a snippet of that. So, let me... Um, uh, come to part three and uh, talk about dialects and ethnolec in, in your backyard, in our backyard, in the Canadian landscape. Okay, let me see, where are we here? All right. So uh, I said at the outset that I had two outstanding professors, uh, Gianrenzo Clivio, who was an historical linguist, so a diachronic linguist, uh, passed away um, a number of years ago, and still living young as ever, uh, Marcel Danesi. Uh, he has a lovely story uh, why his uh, he had to cave to being called Marcel uh, rather than using his Italian name Marcello. Marcel is among the body of profs at U of T who collaborated to document the ethnolec that we call Italiese. So uh, let me see here, am I? Okay, can you, you can see my screen okay? Because I can't see my title. Okay, um, so let me go here. Sorry, sorry. Okay. All right, so Italiese, can you complete the following table? So I'm, to the right, I'm giving you the English word. Uh, to the left, I'm giving you the English word. To the right, I'm giving you the standard Italian equivalent. So we've got store, sink, cake, mortgage, 
fence ticket. To push, to paint, to freeze, uh, smart as an adjective and cheap as an adjective. So let's try this little quiz. So uh, I, I'm gonna have to ask you to speak now. You have to speak. So I have to have someone offer answers. So how do you think we're going to say the word fence? Okay, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, just let oh, us know. Oh, okay, I, I can't see myself. The one, uh, I've, the one I've heard all the time for fence was fencil. Okay, I, Tom, I'll get my, uh, hold on. Am I mute? No, 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 we oh, can hear okay. you. Oh, you, you mean you're, yes. Okay, so you heard fencil? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the term for insurance? Insuranza. Okay. The term for cake? That, so I'm giving you two. One is keka with the CH and cheka without. It was always keka. Okay. So we're using the Italian spelling. Let's not forget. The word for check, however, You know, to write out money to people. Cheka. Yep. Cheka. To freeze. Oh. Oh, that's a tough one. I can't remember. Well, it's very simple. Congelare. We're talking <laughs> about. Frizzare. <laughs> right. <laughs> and to paint. Pintare. Pintare. So now you caught on. <laughs> Very well done, everybody. <laughs> so let me go back. Let me go back to our answers. So what happens in, in our ethnolect? So, you know, we look at the words in Italian. Negozio. Lavandino, sorry, that's supposed to be L in front of that. Lavandino, acquaio, torta, ipoteca, mutuo, recinto, biglietto, spingere, verniciare, congelare, intelligente, economico. Now, in the baggage of the typical migrant, who from Italy would ever have had a mortgage? <laughs> that's who, very true. <laughs> who would have had a sink in the kitchen, a sink in the washroom. Uh, who would ever go to buy, uh, to travel by transport, to travel by train or to travel by bus? They traveled by, by horse and by bicycle. So what we discovered in the emergence of the ethnolect and the adaptation the, the migrants are coming up against, they have to go buy things in a store because they don't make them themselves. They move into a house where running water is in the kitchen and in the washroom. They are, uh, they were told when they arrived, you know, in, in the 1950s when they arrived at Pier 21, they heard, you know, manja keka, right? Yeah. Make a cake, keka, cake. And so there we go, mortgage fence and so forth. And therefore we, they adapt and they give the morphological, the form that they are familiar with, they add it on to the ending of the English word. And depending on who you are or where you're from, you give it an Abruzzese twist, you give it a Sicilian twist, you give it a Neapolitan twist. So we get storo, cinco, checca, morgheggio, fenza, ticchetta, pushare, pintare, frizzare, smarto, chip. <laughs> now, what does not nativize? Well, in the opening class that I give when I teach standard Italian, I say to everybody, I'd like you all to take a very deep breath because I can prove to you in five minutes that you already know 
50 Italian words. And they look at me and they say, what do you mean? And so I start. So what does not nativize? All the words that have already officially entered the Italian language. Where do we go? We go to Starbucks to get a gelato, a macchiato, a cappuccino, a latte. And we ask them, may I please have a biscotti? At which point I say to them, you mean a biscotto, since I'm ordering only one. And then we've got, oh, pasta, pizza, lasagna, even though in fact, lasagna is only one sheet of it. So in Italy, they call it le lasagne. And then we've got all the musical terms, opera, libretto, aria, pianissimo, forte, adagio. And if you listen to classical 96.3, they're using these words every time they launch a tune. So this is what we've seen across the situation in the evolution of dialects, the baggage, mm. the, the, the cultural richness, and I mean baggage in the most positive sense possible, the richness you know, with which um, our migrant immigrants arrive and uh, how they form uh, they keep the glossia in their communities. And in some cases, when they adapt and they get further away, they can still remember these words, but they will use Italiese uh, as the ad language of adaptation. So that's it, everyone. There's my Italian smile and my motto in pursuit of lifelong learning. A most heartfelt thank to you to the Canadian Cologne Italian Club. You are so inspiring. You have no idea how you've inspired us. Thank you to Gord and to all of those who participated. Alla prossima. See you next time. Well, <clears throat> Gabriella, um, one, of the, one of the issues I have with doing Zoom presentations is on the good side, we can invite people like you to come and join us. On the downside, though, it really doesn't do a very good job of, of showing our enthusiasm for what you have just done for us. But I do want to try to portray that on behalf of the audience. I was mesmerized by that. That was amazing. Um, and I'm going to try an experiment. If you guys could all unmute yourselves and give some applause to, to uh, Gabriella, I would very much appreciate that. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. As I said uh, to Gord, I mean, you gave me this very lovely present uh, gift uh, to get me back in. Uh, and I and I and Abril will know that I actually had promised her this presentation uh, when she came on board at York. So Abril, I have a presentation for you if you need it. <laughs> um, it's a, it's a, an, a, it's a, just an, it's a magnificent topic to study. It's diverse. It, it, it's so inclusive. It brings everyone in. Um, you know, if we could be in person, and and I'm really hopeful going forward. You know, for 2023, Gord, you know, we're hoping to come to you, ICAP, to come to you in Kelowna. Um, that's unofficial, but it's that's my dream. Certainly, I, I'm coming to Kelowna anyway, and I'm going to uh, Vernon to visit the Kaitani uh, Center. I mean, you know, that, that, that presentation was stunning. Um, the study of dialects, the, the habits, the, the, you know, I wanted just to say in that little video of the Abruzzesi, did you not see the universal humanity? The universal humanity. Yeah. They're playing boche, they're going shopping, they're at a market. I mean, I would say this is like the planetary humanity because if we're studying the Arabic community, we'll see them going to the market. If we're studying the Chinese community, we're seeing them going to the market. So certainly, you know, to study the languages and the, and the, and the culture and the cultural habits and the traditions, um, what we get a chance to do when we study diachronic linguistics, and we get a chance to enter into the written texts. They are really, really marvelous. I gave you some of those examples at the outset. But, you know, to talk about Manzoni, he wrote the, the Promessi Sposi, the betrothed. He wrote it originally in Milanese. It was called Fermo e Lucia. 
Um, so he's part of La Cuestione de la Lingua. The entire story around Dante and how Tuscan evolves when there was great, there was great competition between Bolognese and Tuscan. Mm -hmm. And the Sicilian school that had been, you know, the, the, kind of, the kingdom of the two Sicilies under uh, Frederick II. I mean, when it was the kingdom of the two Sicilies, it was a hotbed of literary uh, production, poetry, uh, music. I mean, he was an extraordinarily erudite um, um, king. And, and, and it was because of course it fell. And then the competition, the so-called arm wrestling began and Dante with his friend Pietro Bembo won that arm wrestling. <laughs> so that's for another day. Um, I did want to uh, open it up to anyone who might have any questions for Gabriella. And um, after the questions, I'm going to ask Roseanne to uh, say a, a few words on behalf of the club. So if anyone has a question for Gabriella, um, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, just jump in. Uh, Gabriella, it's Dominic Ramponi from Kelowna. Uh, when you were commenting about the uh, English pronunciations of English words in Italian, it brought back a lot of memories. We had lots of relatives come in the 60s out here, and we had this one relative that every day I come home from school, they were renting one of my parents' places, and they learned to speak English by watching the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> <laughs> they, she would watch it, and she'd say the stove or hot water, and, and then my mom wanted them to talk to me in Italian, but they wanted to learn English. So every day after school for a half hour, I had to watch the Beverly Hillbillies. And it was amazing at 65 years old, they learned to speak pretty good English by watching the Beverly Hillbillies. So absolutely, was, absolutely. Well, yeah. you see, the adaptation is so strong. And thank you for reminding me, uh, Dominic, because um, what I wanted to cite to you was a, a statistic which is quite mind boggling that has occurred in Toronto. Well, it's continued to occur in Toronto because, you know, we, seem to have be the you know the city of arrival for many many groups so in my work with the south american communities uh, they have uh, uh, studied the uh, impact of nativization of adaptation uh, that happens when their children begin school so if a young child comes let's say to start grade one, and they will have experienced those five or six years with the family and therefore are fluent in, you know, the Latin American version of their Spanish, whether it's Mexican or Uruguayan, uh, whatever it may be. Um, within four weeks to two months, that child stops speaking the home language. And the pressure that is brought to bear in the family is considerable. So, uh, you know, uh, it is really important, right? I mean, it's really important for people to fit in. And you don't, you can understand these large groups, what they felt, the pressure that they felt when they arrived, that they, there was this, you know, enormous need to, to, uh, to adopt. You can imagine if they were learning um, um, Arkansas English. I, uh, in my, in my, when I teach as well, I, uh, in one of the classes that I do, I, I use uh, some of the versions of Arkansas American English because it's uh, quite pedagogical for certain terms. <laughs> That's for sure. You know, I just want to say it's Roseanne from uh, the, the Italian club um, that uh, a lot of what you had to say reminded me so much of, you know, how my grandmother used to speak. So, you know, we're from Abruzzi and um, the, the Abruzzese language is, is interesting in itself, but, you know, how she tried to communicate in English was exactly how you're saying all of that. And, um, you know, I can, I can still hear her say, you basamento and he'd be like you know okay I'm going to the basement to get the wine but it wasn't you know to the cantina or whatever the term is in Italian 
but it was the basement. So absolutely, or, and, and you can imagine who or, who in Italy, who in Italy, number one had a basement you know, resources. They were nothing ever built below ground, right? I mean, some of the new construction post 1960 is that way. So the Italians call it semi interrato. It's half buried, right? Because you got the windows. Yeah. But uh, of course, you arrive here, you, you go downstairs, you're underneath, you think, well, it's got to be the basement. So it's got to be the basamento. Basamento. And, 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 and the same thing with La Fornace. <laughs> That's right. You know, La Fornace, I mean, it's one of the most important sets of terms we have to teach in Italian, in Italian standard is how, what the words for the house are. Because il riscaldamento a aria, which is what we have, you know, forced air. Italians don't have forced air anyway, you know. So it's very, very interesting. You know, the adaptation is considerable and absolutely important and to be recognized. Well, it's funny because you have formalized this, but it, in our world, it's, it's almost comical because, you know, words like, like basamento or utroco or cement de finish or you know all of those words are, are kind of humorous to us but yes in in your context it makes sense that it's an, a language in itself and um it, it this has been an incredibly fascinating um presentation i just want to thank you on behalf of the italian club for putting this together uh, it's nice to know that um, marketing is alive and well throughout the ages and the evolution of language really is an evolution to meet the needs of the people and it was a, a way of communicating with the people so it's interesting to see that from a language perspective as well. Well as I've said to my students and the two things I mean with my salutation and you know in pursuit of lifelong learning that's the one thing I always wanted my students to know and the second thing I want to say is that you have to imagine a language is like a set of keys. If you don't have the key, you can't open the door. And so it is worthwhile promoting uh, multilingualism and um, bringing to the attention of our children uh, the importance of their heritage language, right? I mean, we've dropped that, that term, right? But it is because, again, it followed a process of being, you know, of, of getting a negative connotation, right? So we, we had to be very careful, right? Putting people on the margins. No, what we're trying to say is we're trying to bring everything to make it always parallel. Standard is important because it's a key to speak around Italy equally and around the globe equally. Within your town, uh, within your region, a standard set of words are required to communicate within. But the maintenance, the, 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 the um, respect and the continuation and the, that it should be in the family and that there should be some time devoted um, to this activity, it enriches the family so deeply so deeply it just enriches the family so deeply so um i hope that you know our activities the way you are i mean the idea that you agreed even to this topic is so magnificent you know that we should be doing this more and we should be reaching out and, and sharing this body of knowledge and um and 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 um you know handing it down to our uh, to our children as well so i i thank you i can, you see i can talk till tomorrow, but uh, I thank you. Uh, it's been really a, a magnificent opportunity for me to do this. And I really look forward to seeing you in person. <laughs> we look forward to seeing you in person too. And okay. next time you come, um, Jill and Gord uh, to Guelph, I'll, uh, we'll arrange another visit. Um, that sounds wonderful. Uh, we, we can't wait to, to go back out there and uh, meet all our ICAP friends. So uh, we're, we're very much looking forward to that. Um, well, I know for our, our uh, friends uh, joining us from Ontario, it is getting a little late for you there. So um, I, I, I can keep this going all night, but we will uh, 
we will draw to a close. Um, this will be going live on our website, if not tomorrow, then Friday, uh, if you want to share it with anyone. Um, and please do, because I think, again, Gabriella, this was this was wonderful. Um, for a manja cake, it was great to uh, to understand a little bit of the calibres that uh, I hear in my in-laws' house. So. Uh, and the origins of it. So this was this was very special. Thank you. Well, my pleasure. My really great, great, great pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, you know, arrivederci to all and, uh, uh, you know, to our meeting in Kelowna. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks to everyone. Bye-bye. Gracias.